entrepreneurial, leadership, intellectual, this is the Cultural Connections Podcast. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Ives, and I am the producer and host of the Cultural Connections podcast. This episode is being recorded live on Sunday, March 19th, 2023 on Facebook. Therefore, if you have a question today for our get our get one of our guests today, please feel free to comment below with your question and we'll do our best to answer them live during the podcast. Today on the podcast, we have an extra special episode here of the podcast for you. We're going to be talking about how one made one man made a difference during World War II during the Holocaust, specifically uh, talking about Chioni Siguhera. Chioni Siguhera helped save the lives of thousands of Jews during the Holocaust by illegally issuing Japanese visas. We have four amazing guests with us today on the podcast, each who have had different ways to tell the uh, to help tell this unknown hero's story. Uh, joining us on the podcast is Christina Rayeko Cooper, Arnold Mazur, Melanie Wallace, Dion, and Dion Estelle Vacari. Let me start off before going any further with introducing you to each of our guests. We'll start with Christina. Christina Rayeko Cooper, virtuoso uh, Christina Rayeko Cooper, has won worldwide acclaim for her musical diversity, artistry, and charismatic stage presence, hailed by the New York Times as sensational in concert and as a striking virtuoso by the Los Angeles Times. Christina has performed as soloist and chamber musician on many of the world's distinguished stages, uh, such as uh, Carnegie, including Carnegie, Carnegie Hall in Lincoln Center, Saturnary Hall of Tokyo, and Radio France in Paris. Her concerto appearances include the Prague Chamber Orchestra, Toronto Symphony, Israel Chamber Orchestra, the Berlin Konzerthaus, uh, and Tours with the Tokyo Yomori Orchestra and Shanghai Symphony. In November of 2022, Ms. Cooper performed as soloist in the world premiere of Leira Auerbach's Symphony No. 6, Vessels of Light, dedicated to Chuani Siguhera and commissioned by Vad Yashin, Yad Vashim, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem, and the American Society of Yad Vashim, the world of uh, Vad, uh, Vad Vashim. The world premiere took place in, in, in uh, Kowanis, Lithuania, the very city in which the Sugihera visas were issued. Following the premiere, Christina performed the world the work with the with the Prague Art Radio Orchestra. The U.S. premiere of her, the work will take place on April 19th in Carnegie Hall, followed by a world tour. Christina also appears as the focus of a new documentary currently in development with Mark Wahlberg's pr- uh, company, uh, Unrealistic Ideas, entitled A Symphony for Sugihara. Christ, uh, Christina R- uh, Rico Cooper received her bachelor's and master's degree in music, as well as her doctor doctorate of musical arts from the Juilliard School, where she studied with Joel Krosnick. She is currently a visiting professor at the Bukhamnin Mahada School at Tel Aviv University and lives in Israel with her husband and three children. Next, we have Arnold Mazur. Arnie Mazur is a performer, producer, and writer. He has written for the New York Times, WCBS News Radio 880, Fox 5 News, and currently for the trialstatenews.com. Mazur currently has two documentaries in production. Arnie produced for MSG Network and was the associate producer of The Last Trophy, a nationally recognized documentary about the stripping of the Syracuse lacrosse team of their national championship in 1990. The documentary is now a cult film for lacrosse players. Mazur was the senior producer of the nationally televised Leon Charney Report and the executive producer of the Bill Mazur Radio Show. A, gradu- a graduate of Hobart College, Mazur went there to play lacrosse but wound up getting an education. After graduation, he returned to New York City where he pr- uh, pursued a career in theater. Arnie worked both in Hollywood and New York, appearing in such films as Diner and Taps. Uh, he is, his television work includes appearances on many versions of Law and Order, Swift Justice, Diner uh, Pilot, and an assortment of Russian gangsters on many programs. Mazur thrived on soap opera work, including All My Children, As the World Churns, Emmy-nominated segment, and two stints on as two different characters on One Life to Live. Stage work includes a streetcar named uh, Desert, uh, Desire, People's, um, People's Light and Theater Company, On the Waterfront, Cleveland Playhouse, the critically praised, uh, uh, praised out Off-Broadway, 
Over the Tavern, the award-winning Jiva Theater in Rochester, New York, and Robert Wool's hit Lit. Uh, hit lit. Uh, Mazur made his Broadway debut with George C. Scott on Borrowed Time. Uh, on Borrowed Time, his voice has also been uh, heard on many audiobooks, including Game of Shadows, the best-selling story of Balco and Barry Bonds. Next, we have Melanie Wallace. Melanie Wallace, a renowned and Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker, spent several decades working as a public media executive for PBS for the PBS science series Nova. And while there, she was able to bring the remarkable history film Sugihara, Conspiracy of Kindness, to the attention of the PBS executives, which ultimately led to its national PBS broadcast. Currently, she is cons a consul consulting as a global media strategist. And finally, we have Dion Estelle Vacari. Award-winning filmmaker Dion Estelle Vacari independently produces stories that promote the advancement of our individuality and global interdependence. Born and raised in Montreal, Canada, Dion Estelle is a champion for other filmmakers and most notably through her extensive work with the International Documentary Association, an organization for which she served as president of the board. Dion Estelle is currently producing Imagine a Better World, the Nellie Toll story, as she returns to the theme she last explored in her award-winning film, Sugihara, Conspiracy of Kindness, our, our human ability to triumph over any adversity. Imagining a Better World documents the life and achievements of a remarkable woman who, surviving a devastating childhood in Nazi-occupied Poland, emerges, emerges from the darkness as an artist, writer, and later on as a therapist. On an uplifting note, Diane Estelle is currently in post-production on the story of our late national treasure, American maestro Sammy Niceto, one of the greatest contributors of the last century to the field of jazz, a story that reminds us all to never let anyone steal our dreams. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you. Great. All right, well, we're going to get started here. And I want to start with Deanne, because I think that, that's really, in my mind, from everything that I've heard, we're hearing about the, this amazing uh, story of Sugi Hara begins. And I want you to start off with telling our audience a little bit more about this film and a little bit of history behind it and how it really came to be and how you got involved in making this film. Um, 1993, 1994, 1995, I was a uh, interviewer for the Steven Spielberg uh, Shoah Foundation. Um, they were gathering Holocaust survivor testimony, and I went and donated time um, to bear witness to Holocaust survivor story. So I spent pretty much two and a half years listening to the horrors of World War II and of the Holocaust. And uh, in 1995, I was invited at the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles to go to an evening. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I was invited. And I asked if I could bring my husband. They said yes. And that evening, they were honoring uh, Mrs. Sugihara, Yukiko Sugihara. And it, there was this moment in the evening, she only spoke Japanese and she had a translator and I turned to my husband and I said, I have to tell this story. And um, my husband said, good luck. <laughs> you don't know anything about Japan. You know, you don't know anything, of, you don't know anyone in Japan. So uh, sure, honey, no problem. But I knew when I heard her story that um, after listening to all this horror that the world needed to hear what this man had done. And it affected me tremendously uh, in ways that I cannot explain. It was more of a calling than a great career move at that time. And um, I introduced myself through the translator at the end of the evening and I told her that I would tell her story to the world and she bowed and laughed and, and that was the beginning of it. Wow, it's really incredible. And I, and I have to start off also by saying as well that I had the opportunity to view the film last night and it really is truly an incredible film in the way it was the story was told. And it, it is truly remarkable hearing the story and seeing it. I mean, and, and just listening to all the details of what Sugi Hara has done and had done. Um, I'm going to then go on to you and asking my next question to you is what. Um, can you give us a brief trajectory? I mean, let's start now with a little bit more of a brief trajectory of the making of the film Sugi Hara Conspiracy of Kindness from beginning to end. I mean, how did you piece all everything together? How did, how did you? Quick notes, because it was a 10-year journey. Um, first, 
I not Japanese, evidently, I am not Jewish. So I was thrown into two worlds that I knew nothing about. Uh, I look at the film today and honestly, I have no idea how I made this film. It, it truly was a calling and I jumped in and I just did it. Um, the first thing I had to do was to get the rights to uh, the story, which was held by a very, very famous documentary filmmaker at the time. So I kind of gave up there. Uh, and then six months later, that filmmaker lost the rights and I got a call saying, are you still interested? And I said, yes. Um, so I had to present a budget and a proposal to Densu Japan, who all, all held the rights of um, Sugihara's story through Mrs. Sugihara's book. And I had to work my way through that. And then they came back and they said, um, who are you? And uh, we would like uh, a name director, preferably male name director, and uh, we want an American partner. So then I had to work my way through that and made that happen. And uh, the journey, I found the story in 1995 and I started shooting in 1998. So there was three years of negotiating the story. And then we took off from there and finished the film by 2000. Incredible. And I know from there, I'm going to jump over to Melanie now because Melanie her, got word of this story, this amazing film and got it airing on nationally on PBS. Can you walk us through how you were able, Melanie, how you were able to get this film on PBS? And when you first heard about this, this film, what was your initial thoughts about it? Well, it's one of those things where you show up and you don't know what's going to happen. And then all these good things start to happen. So I was attending the Hot Docs Festival in Toronto and I had an opportunity to have dinner with a group of uh, filmmakers and I sat near Deanna Stelvacari and I'm representing the Nova Science Series looking for science programs. And Deanne, I say, so what are you doing? He says, well, I have this film about a Japanese diplomat, his name is Sugihara. And I actually had known his name, although I didn't know the details of his story. So I said, Deanne, maybe you would send it to me. I'd love to see it. And then what did you say, Deanne? <laughs> <laughs> said on my list of marketing or basically putting a film out there Melanie would have never been on that list they had <laughs> nothing to do with science or Nova or uh, anything that she represented at the time so the next morning after a lot of wine I handed her a VHS cassette <laughs> and this was the three-hour version right Dan yes this was the version that had, we had just shown the film we had won a very prominent award called the Pere Lawrence Award, which is in my field is quite prominent. Uh, it's like the, an Oscar for documentary film uh, within the world documentary filmmaker. And we had shown at the United Nation in New York, that was the premiere of the film. Um, it was, a, we cut it as a three part series originally. We were way ahead of our time about a series, but we felt that the story was so complex uh, and so historical in content that we wanted to uh, let it breed. Um, it was 144 minute in three parts, which then uh, we handed to Melanie. So that's what her, she saw and then brought it to her partner, Paula Absol. Yeah. Right. And so I had a phone call. Uh, May, that was May. That was May uh, 2002. And then in July, I got an email saying, we're coming to Pasadena for a press conference and Paula wants to meet you. Right. That's and right. it began the journey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, from our point of view at WGBH, you know, Paula and I did science programs, but we saw this film and we knew it was extraordinary. So we just started showing it to the people who had the decisions for other programs beyond science. And everybody who saw it said, oh, yeah, this should be on PBS. Oh, yeah, it should be on PBS. So it's kind of all who you know and you follow your path. And then they said, yeah, OK, well, let, let's see if we can make this happen. And, I'm, and I'm, it was a journey, but it was a extraordinary journey. And I'm so grateful to have been included in this path. It truly still is extraordinary. It is. Is. I mean, let's face it, none of us would be here if not for Sugihara-san. <laughs> 
Very true. I'm going to jump now next over to Christina, who is is very more impre- impressive in the musical end of things. And ha- but let, I want you to give us an introduction, Christina, on how you heard about Sugihara and what led you to get really involved in making music and and how you got involved with this amazing, inspiring story. Well, first of all, I want to say what a fine film. Um, These that Dion made and it was really, really, uh, uh, anyone that has a chance to must see it. It really is uh, uh, a tour de force and incredibly inspiring and touching. And um, I loved it so much. Okay, but how did I get involved with Sugihara? So I'm half Japanese, um, but that really doesn't have much to do with it. Rather, um, coming from a completely non-religious musical family where if there was any kind of religion per se in my family, I guess you would call it music. Um, And to make a very long story short, Eventually, I met the man who was to become my husband, and he came from a completely, totally different background than I did, and that he was born into a modern Orthodox Jewish family. Um, In fact, I think in reality, that's the reason that we were able to get married, because we were both complete committophobes, so there was no possible way we could ever, ever get married, so there was no pressure at all. (laughs) anyways um eventually despite all the odds uh after a very lengthy conversion process uh we did indeed get married and at that time although his parents had passed away quite a bit before i even met him um i knew that they were both survivors and i knew that his father that he had spent time in Japan and spent time in Shanghai. And in fact, that he even spoke both Shanghainese and Japanese. And later in life, his profession was as um, a pearl dealer where his primary partner was in Japan. So, and I saw these, you know, Asian things in his apartment. And I saw that, you know, there are these things that were there, but I didn't know anything about Sugihara, nothing had ever been mentioned about him until one day about two years into our marriage, Lem was sent a commemorative coin, which uh, is issued by the Israel Mint, where they do these coins of the different um, uh, righteous among the nations, non-Jews who saved Jews during the war. And, you know, I said, well, what's that? (laughs) You know, what's that coin? And he proceeded to tell me um, a bit about Sugihara. And although I guess in a sense, I have a much more personal connection to it because to, to Sugihara and his story, because well, my husband, obviously, and my three beautiful children would never exist without Sugihara. So that's a very personal connection. But there was something about the story, just in him telling it, that even though I didn't know that much about it to start with, it just touched me so deeply. And Dan came from from a completely objective point, but the way that she said that it was a calling for her, for me, I don't know if it was a calling as much as that I just, when I heard the story, I just felt this need to bring this story forward for there are people that know the story, of course, much thanks to your documentary. But even so, I would say the regular layperson hadn't, you know, doesn't know of Sugihara. I hadn't heard of Sugihara. Um, certainly the people that I talked to within my immediate circle hadn't heard of him. And I just felt this compelling need to bring the story forward, especially given you know what's going on in the world right now, the very difficult times that we're going through um as human beings with the mass migration problems and crises and refugees and war and you know what's going on with totalitarian governments and the upheavals um of course rising anti-semitism is a quite obvious one and also even anti-asian hate right all things that we thought were we were well past her rearing their ugly head. And it, I really felt that this was a story that needed to bring, be brought forward. And unlike 
most of you here on this podcast, I am not a filmmaker. I'm not a writer, I'm not an actress, I'm not an actor. Um, I don't do podcasts, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I am a musician. And this is something that I've done my entire life. I've always done lots of new music and um, I realize I'm not exactly objective, but I truly believe that music is a universal language and it has the ability to communicate feelings and emotions and universal human um, touch points in a way that nothing else can because it doesn't have words actually. So that was the point that I became quite determined to have a very grand musical work um, commissioned and written in dedication to Chuni Sugihara. And the reason that I wanted it to be a newly commissioned work rather than just being, you know, a concert where you play some Japanese music and some Jewish music or, you know, something that was a mix of the two, which I have done, by the way. In fact, I just did one in New York, but I wanted it to, a substantial work to be written that would have possibilities of having the kind of staying power that meant that it could last for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Because uh, most unfortunately, I think that Chunisugihara's story of humanity, basic kindness and compassion is a story that's always going to be have to be told. Humanity doesn't change, right? All we can do is do our best is to harness what we have and make it a better world for us today. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely spot on there. I just want to remind our audience that's just tuning in with us. If you are watching the podcast live, we're on Facebook right now. Otherwise, you're listening or watching at another time. But we're live on Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday, March 19th, 2023, live here on Facebook. We're talking about an inspiring story here during World War II of the Holocaust with the work of Sugi Hera. And these four guests that we have joining us today, Diana Estelle Vicari, Christina C uh, Cooper, Melanie Wallace, and Arnie Mazur all have a part in telling this incredible story. And I, so if you have a question for our, one of our guests, please feel free to comment below. I want to let uh, Arnie get a chance to speak here because I think it's important that we bring to the next part to this where that there is actually another documentary film that is in production right now with Christina uh, about her music. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that and how you heard about this story and what led you to get involved? Um, first of all, Brian, I'm, I'm worried because the intro to your show had intellectual up there. And the one thing I never want to be labeled is an intellectual because I don't frankly think I qualify. Um, Honestly, I've known Dr. Cooper, Ms. Cooper, Christina Cooper, for a long period of time. <clears throat> as it happened, I was living in Israel, as she is now. <laughs> and we went out to dinner one night, and she was telling me the story of Suyahara, which I'd heard of, because I spent a, a long period of my life Studying the Holocaust, um, you know, in my mind, uh, Claude Lanzmann Shoah, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, is probably the best telling of the events, specifically in Europe. Um, and I said to Christina, she was telling me this, well, I have this concert commissioned and I'm going to be going around and I'm going to be playing concerts in honor of Sugihara. And, you know, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have children. And I said to her, wow, can I film this? <laughs> and that's really how it started. Um, so we shot a uh, sizzle reel. Uh, we got it around. COVID uh, hindered us for a long period of time. I finally was able, um, through connections, uh, because uh, for years I uh, was a, a season ticket holder to the New York Jets. And M M Mark Wahlberg's head of documentary also happens to be a Jet fan, and I was going with his brother, so we got the introduction, and his name is Archie Gibbs, and they became interested in this story. They picked it up. They're working with us now. But as I've said many times, forgive me, 
Christina is an example of the Holocaust is an event which many people want to put in a box and just put it over here. What it has done is it's filtered down in generations. And what we're looking for in this film is to show the effect it has on people now. When I've encountered Europeans, they're like, oh yeah, that happened and you know we don't wanna deal with it. And I remember saying to somebody from Latvia once, well, I think Europe <clears throat> has a Holocaust hangover the same way the United States has a slavery hangover. These are subjects that are not dealt with. And what we've lost here, and I, I think the ambition that I am focusing on with this project, and I think, is how it filters into everyday life. For example, how it filters into Christina's life. She wouldn't be doing this. If it weren't for Sugi Hara, she wouldn't have children. Mm -hmm. These are things that lead, this is a generational thing that filters down. And for me, I mean, Lanzmann touched on it briefly in Shoah when he interviewed the children of Holocaust survivors and how they were affected. This is a, a, a multi-generational event that nobody really considers anymore. They just want to put it away. And I think through Christina's music, the fact that she is just such an incredible artist. I don't know how many people, how many of you have seen her perform, but that in itself is an event. And how this filters into her life, her music, and her art is incredible. Plus the fact that she's <laughs> half Japanese and an Orthodox Jew. I mean, that's certainly going to play up. She's hitting on all the all the hot points. So, I mean, that's how I got involved with this. And I, I wrote it up. I submitted it. And I've been running with it. So that's how I got here. It's incredible. And, you know, as you mentioned that, I think this is a good time. I'm going to, we do have a, a clip of uh, that Christina said of her playing. And I think we, we, it is, it really is remarkable to listen. So we'll play it. I'm going to play a few minutes of that right now. Uh, but again, just a quick re reminder before we go to that, that I want to remind those just tuning in with us that if you are watching live, you're watching live on Facebook, and this is the Cultural Connections podcast live on Sunday, March 19th, 2023. And we're talking about the incredible story of Sugi Hara and his work and the different and how four different people here, Arnie Mazur, Diane Estelle Vacari, Christina Cooper and Melanie Wallace all have a part in this amazing man's story and the work that they did to bring it to life. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play a few minutes of her of Christina's uh, uh, playing for us. So we have a so we can see a quick little snippet of that. And here we go. Oh. So I don't think I should stop. <laughs>
Remarkable. Really very remarkable uh, listening to that. And again, if I just want to recap one more time for those that are just tuning in with us here, you're listening or you're watching the Cultural Connections podcast. If you're watching, we're live here on Facebook and we're live on Saturday, Sunday, March 19th, 2023, talking about the incredible work of Sugi Hara and the different ways his story is being told. Uh, thanks to these four guests, Arnie Mazur, Deanne Estelle Vicari, Christina Cooper, and Melanie Wallace. I'm going to jump back to Deanne here because I want to go back to your film, which is really one of the starting points here, that I believe at least. And I, I want you to tell us a little bit further in this film. And let's talk about the choice of the title you you titled the film conspiracy of kindness what is the meaning behind this incredibly powerful film um christina by the way amazing beautiful i can't wait to see you perform at carnegie hall um we went through april 19th just so you know <laughs> the plug. i'm sorry what's the date on that again but I, I didn't hear. Can you say that again, please? <laughs> um, Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> we went through many different, uh, we, it was a process. Look, it took us 1998 to 2000, we finished the film. So we went through many, many different uh, evolution of the title. Definitely we wanted Sugihara's name in there. Uh, but it became very evident through the storytelling that there was a conspiracy that went on. He did it against government orders and he could not have done it without other people involved, other diplomats involved that went along with his decision. No matter what he did, even if he said, yes, I'm writing these visas and some of them were just piece of papers. They were not even real passport. He could have never accomplished and being able to migrate so many Jews outside of Lithuania if he had not had the help of other people within Lithuania and outside of Lithuania. So we really realized that it was a conspiracy of kindness. Um, it was a humanitarian deed that many people somehow all vibrated together to make this happen. And uh, also, I think this is an important thing to know is that we all have that innate goodness in us. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to tell this film is that, you know, we're not all bad. Like we look at the Holocaust and it is horrendous. I mean, it's beyond words, but there are good people that have done good deeds at the risk of their life, their families' lives. And I've always asked myself the question, what if someone knocked on my door in the middle of the night and said, you need to hide me, I'm in trouble. Uh, somebody's gonna lynch me or I'm going, my family's gonna get killed or I'm gonna be taken to uh, you know, a camp. What would I do? What part of me would say, I'll put my life at risk and my family's life at risk to do something good and therefore conspiracy of kindness. Incredible. No, it's really incredible. I, I see where you can, where you got. Brian, I think you muted. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yes. Back. I'm back. Okay. All right. Um, tr again, truly really incredible. I can see where you've come up with that title. It really is an incredible title. And I think it fits the narrative of the documentary very well. Um, I want to jump back here to Christina, because I think the music parts of this is so important. And for Christina, let, let me ask you, um, what, why did you, what, what did you find so special and personal about Sugi Hara's story that led you to really wanting to put all this time and energy into making this, this happen? Well, I mean, I guess there's, of course, the obvious, which has already been stated, which is that my not just my beautiful family, but my whole way of life, my whole beautiful and, and blessed life would not exist without Sugihara. And that, that can sound quite trite, but if you think about it, if you really think about it, it's, it's quite affecting, of course. And as Dion said, I mean, that there is, 
I believe an inner Sugihara in all of us somewhere or in almost all of us. And I think one of the reasons that Sugihara's story is so remarkable is that, you know, we, again, when you talk about the whole cause, it's such an overwhelming subject. The whole idea of it happening, of that, it, that it happened is so incomprehensible and the numbers are so huge. At a certain point, it just becomes something that we can't relate to at this point. You know, it happened a long time ago. And even if we have a personal connection to it, it's just so massive. Um, but when you talk about one man, one person, someone who wasn't this outsized personality or uh, hero, someone who was quite modest, someone who never wanted recognition for what he did, he was simply, who didn't think that what he did was remarkable. He just thought that he was doing the right thing. Um, for me, that's something that people can relate to. People can relate to one person and how they behaved and how they felt. And uh, this was this was incredibly profound to me. And also on a more a, a more personal note, I suppose, is that yes, I am half Japanese. And although I don't act at all Japanese, as my mother would points out to me quite often. I'm much too loud, much too emotive, uh, not nearly polite enough, and I speak too loudly. Um, but <laughs> I do understand the Japanese culture, um, and I know what it means to go against authority in Japan, to go against your superiors, to go against protocol. It's, it's just not something that's done. It's just not something that's even part of the makeup of the culture. It's not even something to rebel against because it's not, it's just, it's just something that doesn't happen. So for someone to do this, for a Japanese man, a diplomat, in addition to everyone, everything else, to actually go against his superiors and protocol and orders to do something like this is really quite incredible. But at the same time, both his family and my, the Japanese side of my family comes from a samurai background. And there is something to the code of the samurai, which is called the Bushido code, which also makes them so very Japanese in that the code, if you bring it down to its simplest form, is simply that you do the right thing. Doesn't it matter what's going on around you. Doesn't matter what chaos, violence, upheavals are happening around you. You tune out the noise, you listen to your inner self, and you do what's right. It's usually not complicated. The circumstances might be very complicated. The consequences might be quite complicated, but actually knowing what's right and what's wrong usually is very, very simple. So there was something about this combination that for me is quite personal because of course, yes, I do come from a half Japanese background. I come from a sort of a mixed background. I understand what it's like to sort of try to find yourself within that cultural clashes and mix. And yes, being a converted Orthodox Jew and knowing that what Sugihara did saved so many is a very personal story for me. Absolutely. I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, believe it or not, we're reaching already to the last few minutes of the podcast. And within those last few minutes, I want to jump back to Arnie to try to bring this in a way, uh, full circle in a way. And I think one of the questions that I, I'd like to ask you is why, I mean, why are stories like Christine is important and, and specifically why, why making why why make this story why can you why why is it so important i guess is the question well as i've said and it's interesting because we use the the word holocaust and and many times i feel that it's an insufficient word and i would rather use the word shoah because in hebrew it, it is more encompassing and i go back to what i said previously um none of us here living at this time can fully understand what it was like at that time. No matter what we read, no matter what we see, and many people become inundated, if you will, with it and in, immune to the whole concept. I first, when I was at Hobart, as I said, uh, I got into play lacrosse and wound up getting an education. And at Hobart, you had to write 
a essay your junior year to qualify for your senior year. Well, somebody in the class behind me, there was a professor at Northwestern named Arthur Butts who first came up with the idea that the Holocaust was in fact created by Jews in Hollywood. And all the scenes were shot on the back lots of, NB, of um, the studios. He presented this as his qualification for his senior year and was summarily, he didn't pass to say the least. But my point is this, what we're witnessing now, what we're seeing now, it still persists as people try to walk away from it, know the numbers are wrong, so on and so forth. Even um, in New York now, there's a, a musical called Parade, which opened about Leo Frank, who was a Jew who was lynched in Georgia. And people are trying to whitewash that. Seeing somebody like Christina, and by the way, again, every time you play, it just blows me away. It really does. Seeing Christina and her family and how it filters in, I feel personally that it's important to tell the story of again, and I'm repeating myself and I apologize for doing so, how this historical event still reverberates today and how it will continue to do so. I mean, I remember sitting with somebody who said, a Holocaust survivor said to her, yeah, it's time for the Jews just to get over it and move on. And I said, really? Do you think the Native Americans have gotten over their genocide? Do you think the Armenians have gotten over theirs? For whatever reason, and this again, the Holocaust brings up many elements of anti-Semitism, so on and so forth, and we can go there about cliches, but to tell the story and how it reverberates and how it still lives today, to me, is crucial. And somebody like Sugihara, who, and to quote a line that, Sugi, uh, that uh, Christina says in the film, there's a Japanese saying, the nail that stands up, you have to slap it down. For somebody to do that was incredible. And that's why I think this film is important. And I think I couldn't agree further. I, I think everything you just said, I think that's a perfect way to start to conclude here uh, as we reach the end of our podcast. I want to thank all of you, Arnie, Dion, Christina, and Melanie, uh, for joining me today on the podcast and telling this incredible story of this hero during, uh, during the Holocaust. I think it's so important that we hear stories like this especially today when the the media can always is not is not the best at I don't want to say it is not always the most reliable source to hear these type of stories it's so important that these stories get out there and that we and that people hear these stories because there is as Arnie just mentioned so much anti-semitism out there and it is it, it's an unfortunate situation but I think it has to do a lot with the modern day times where we're in I think partially in my own opinion from being in the communications background of social media having a big factor into that as well which is a very unfortunate situation but with all that said again I want to thank the four of you for joining me today on the podcast if you have questions, comments, or would like to submit ideas for future episodes of the podcast, please feel free to email me directly at brianives at gmail.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-I-V-E-S at gmail.com. So again, if you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes of the podcast, please uh, feel free to submit them to me. If you are in New York on, what is that date again? April 19th. I'm sorry, what's the date again? I, I didn't hear you guys. It will I, be I, there. No, <laughs> I'll be there. It's, it's wait, it's in April? It's in April and it's the 19th. 19th. Okay, I just want to make sure. And it's 2023. 20, yes, I forgot what year I was in. That's April 19th, 2023. Isn't that right? Get it right? Yes. Isn't it Carnegie Hall? Isn't yeah. that Carnegie Hall? Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Historical Carnegie Hall. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Brian, thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Thank yes. you so much for hosting us and uh, 
Absolutely. It's an important subject. Thank you. 2023, go to Carnegie Hall and check out Christina playing. You, It is truly something you won't want to miss. Uh, that said, I want to again thank everyone for tuning in with us here today on the Cultural Connections Podcast. I'm Brian Ives. I'm the producer and host of the Cultural Connections Podcast. Thanks for watching. Thank you again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to check out our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch this episode again in its entirety on our YouTube channel. This podcast is also available on listening platforms Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Breaker, Radio Public, and New TV. Thanks again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections Podcast.